All right, Paul, you've dedicated a lot of your life to going out and looking at quasars. What's the weirdest quasar that you've seen? Well, most quasars look blue. This is a true color picture of a quasar I took, and it looks blue. And this is what you'd expect, because um, here's the spectrum of a quasar looks like. You remember that you've got the accretion disk. Uh, we talked about these around white dwarfs. The inner bits are going to be incredibly hot, 20, 30,000 degrees. So they're going to have a spectrum that peaks up here. And then as you go further and further out, you're going to have bits that peak at lower and lower and lower wavelengths. And it all together, you get a spectrum that looks like this. And why does that look blue, apart from the fact I colored the graph in blue? Um, well, let's look at something that looks sort of white, or maybe slightly yellowish, the sun. This is what the spectrum of the sun looks like. And if you compare the two, you have to bear in mind the human eye perceives as green light at these sort of wavelengths. Yep. So these sort of wavelengths in the middle, the two spectra aren't that different. The human eye perceives as red the wavelengths down here. And in this case, the sun is actually much brighter than the quasar, relatively speaking. But when you go down here to the wavelengths the human eye perceives as blue, the quasar is much brighter. So you've got something that's much more blue light and much less red light, so it's going to look blue. Okay. Makes sense to me. Okay, well, this is all making sense, but this is a normal quasar. This is what most quasars look like. But if you search for quasars, not in optical wavelengths, but say in gamma rays or hard radio or high frequency um, X rays or something like that, you find a lot of quasars that are this color. So, what color is that? I'm colorblind, Paul. Well, it's, it's a not sort blue. of. It's not blue. It's a kind of pinky, purple, sort of rather okay. revolting colour, actually. I think this is my college colours back at Cambridge. Um, and you shouldn't get this from an accretion disk. Accretion disk should be very hot. As the gas swirls down the throat of the black hole, it should be 30,000 degrees. You should be getting blue light, damn it. Okay. And if you look at the spectrum of this, it's quite different. There are no emission lines, no absorption lines, no anything, just the dead flat line. Kind of looks like it's a dead, a dead object if this was its heart, okay? Yes. So, nothing. And what's, what, remind me what a quasar looks like normally? Okay, well, the quasar would look like this yeah, blue okay, line here. Okay. So, that's no way you'd mistake the two. Yep. And in fact, this line keeps on going out to enormous wavelengths. This is just optical light, but it keeps on going all the way out to the hardest gamma rays we can measure and out the way to the lowest frequency radio we can measure. Pretty much dead flat the whole way. Why does it look this horrible shade of pinkish purple? Well, you can pair to the spectrum of the sun again, which is what the human eye perceives as white. Yep. And it's below the sun at green wavelengths, but above at both ends, above at both blue and red. So oh. if you get something with lots of blue and red, but not much green. You get purple. Yes, or in fact, pink. you get exactly this color. Okay. Oh. So what could be causing this? These things are seriously weird. I mean, first of all, it was a totally strange spectrum that goes over such an incredible range, all the way from hard gamma rays to the furthest radio. They're also very strongly polarized. Normal light, sometimes the light rays are going up and down, and sometimes they're left and right. It's, for a normal thing like a black body, it's a mixture of the two. But these ones are often very strongly just one or just the other, and sometimes even change from one to the other. Okay, so normally you don't get polarized light from spheres. You need to have something that's really pointy in one direction or something. Yeah, probably like a radio transmitter or something. Radio yeah. transmitters give you polarized light. Right. And then these things vary on time scales of minutes even sometimes. Minutes? Um, they often are called intraday variables, which means they normally a quasar is never going to vary within one day, but certainly on time scales of hours and sometimes even faster than that, they seem to change in brightness. Well, that seems to be faster than how long it would take light to get across one of these supermassive black holes. It's eight minutes from here to the sun. For example. Yeah, so these things are... are so they're violating any sort of common seems sense. seems to be whatever it's coming from is coming from an incredibly small location, smaller even than the very small area you're already talking about for the event horizon of these black holes. Now, you said these things are really bright in the radio. Now, when you have really bright sources in the radio, you can look at them in detail there. So doesn't that mean we could go in and we could put radio telescopes on different sides of the planet, of the Earth, look up and use the whole Earth's diameter as a giant radio telescope? Yes, this is called very long baseline interferometry when you combine telescopes all over the world, and sometimes even in space. And if you use that, um, this is actually from the Hubble Space Telescope, but it was first discovered using those radio telescopes. You look right in at the center of these things, what you can see is there's usually a bright blob, which we think is the center, and then a bunch of blobs sort of making a one-sided jet. 
Oh. So we've talked, a lot of these quasars have two sided jets. These ones seem to have one sided jets. They squirt stuff out in one direction only, as far as we can see. And you can look at these lumps in the jet, and you can actually see them moving out because of the superb resolution of these sorts of telescopes. So you see this blob is a certain distance from the centre here, and as time goes on, it's getting further away. These all moving out from the centre. And so this is these lines are showing what you would expect if something was moving at six times the speed of light. And that's the real puzzle. You can work out how fast these things are moving out, and they seem to be going considerably faster than light. Uh, well, that, that would be a problem for what we've already talked about in this course, I would think. So perhaps uh, we need to investigate this a bit further. Okay, so let's try and figure out how we measure these speeds and what could be wrong with this.